February 3rd, 2013, which in America, the United States of America, means that there's some kind of major sporting event going on. It's Super Bowl Sunday, and just like every other year, uh, every when Super Bowl Sunday has rolled around, we've been here, because uh, that's the way it works. It is. Would you, would you say this was the... The TAE pregame show. Yeah, there you go. The TAE pregame show. Anyway, we are live. You can find out more information at, about the organization and the, and the show uh, at the web addresses that were listed previously. Uh, this is a live call-in show. We're going to be taking calls shortly. We're out of Austin, Texas, and we stream live over the Internet. And occasionally we even post uh, the show up on uh, YouTube. So you can stop emailing about that. We're, we're working on getting that uh, back together and started. Um, I'm Matt Delaney this week. Join me, Tracy Harris. Welcome. You have lots of like candy canes. And I do. Of stuff. I still have candy canes. It's like mo magic Moses. I have my Clary's lip balm. Clary's from uh, Rudolph. I have no idea what that's referring to. Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. I know Rudolph. Did you remember the claymation? Yes. That's his girlfriend. Oh yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> why do you have it? It was a stocking stuffer. Oh. <laughs> I've already eaten all my stocking stuffers. <laughs> But I guess you can't really, well, I guess you could eat lip balm. Anyway, it's, it's a live call-in show. You had some stuff that you wanted to address real quick before we yeah, get to Yeah, I did, I did. I had a, a dialogue with somebody recently, and I just want to kind of clarify some things. Um, they had said that it was difficult for them to tell the difference between socialization and indoctrination. And I, I guess, um, naively took them to be saying that they really didn't understand the difference and would like that clarified. But in reality, it was a passive-aggressive um, rhetorical question meant to assert that there is no difference. Like, rather than saying there is no difference, the right. person was pretending to ask what the difference is, but really it was, you know, like I say, rhetorical assertion. Um, but there is a difference. And uh, there was one, I guess, one point in the conversation where I asked a friend of mine who is, uh, has studied social anthropology and also um, linguistics, and I said, can you come and look at this thread and see what it is I'm not communicating? Because I'm having difficulty understanding what it is that I'm saying that's hard to understand, and mm -hmm. they're not understanding it. They're not. And so he came and kind of did a review of the thread, and then he kind of posted a clarification. And the one thing that he did say that I said, well, I would be willing to... Um, kind of, I guess, adopt that perspective, was he, he was like, well, it's possible that what the person is saying is that indoctrination is a form of socialization that is like an unhealthy form of socialization. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I would certainly be amenable to that. I mean, if somebody wants to say socialization is, you know, healthy, healthy structuring of like a person to help them be successful in the society, that's you know, I, I was arguing that it was different than uh, the unhealthy indoctrination that happens when you try to coercively force someone to believe certain things. Um, but what he was saying is that you could probably look at it under a broad umbrella of socialization and then say that this was just a very bad form of socialization. Yeah. And if that's, you know, th I was like, well, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But, of course, this turned out to not be what the other person was asserting. They were just simply asserting, no, it, there's no difference. Um, which, which a, to me, kind of strikes me as odd because it's kind of like saying there's no difference between teaching and indoctrinating. It, well, there are people that say there's no difference between education and indoctrination. I've mm -hmm. heard that before, too. I compared it to the difference between parenting and abusing a child. And I said, you know, when you talk about parenting, um, y you could say, I suppose, that abusing your kid is a form of parenting that is like a really crappy form of parenting. You know what I mean? It's like a bad form of parenting. And one of the things they were talking about in this dialogue was that religion, um, well, religion does good things too, even though it does bad things. And I was like, well, abusive parents. You know, you could be sexually yeah. abusing your child and buy them presents and feed them well, which, you know, feeding them well and buying them gifts would be nice. Um, but you could still be abusing them, which is not good, you know. And so you can be a good parent and do good things for your child and not abuse them. You know, and you can be an abusive parent and also do some good things for your kid. Now, 
that doesn't mean that there's no difference between healthy parenting and abuse. <laughs> just because there might be some things in common there and just because there may be some similarly expressed goals. But the, the idea of socialization, when you say someone is not well socialized or when you're trying to social, help somebody to re-socialize into an environment, usually that is in, viewed as beneficial to the person in a way that isn't uh, forced or coerced. You're trying to actually help them be successful by simply teaching them to get along. So for example, if I were gonna travel to another country where they had some different rules of etiquette or different rules of how they eat or things that were polite or not polite, I would make an attempt to learn those things so that I don't inadvertently offend somebody in the culture, that mm -hmm. I know how to like uh, eat with chopsticks, for example, if I was gonna go somewhere where it might be, I might not find a knife and fork you know, readily available. Um, None of this would be stuff that would be coerced on me. If I went to learn the language, for example, if I was going to Japan and I went and took some classes on you know, basic Japanese for, um, uh, for communication purposes, just general conversational Japanese, those would be things that would be helping me to socialize, helping me to get in there and be able to be somewhat successful as a visitor in that country or as a tourist in that country. There would be nothing about learning the language, learning the, the customs. None of that would require someone to coerce me or convince me that it was better to do it this way than this other way. There'd be nothing in there that would be threatening to me that would be, they wouldn't say it's just an authoritarian mandate and you have to do it because this is the way you do it. Yeah. It's like, yes, this is the way they do it there. You're not going to be arrested if you pull out a plastic fork. Um, you can do it differently. They'll just see it as weird. But no, they're not going to you know, do anything horrible to you for, for deviating from these just like customary things. It's just be considered odd. It might be considered rude. But in general, it, these are just social things. Now, there are times when um, healthy socialization uh, would result in coercion, um, but it wouldn't be like a, so much a mental coercion. It would be, for example, if someone were murdering other citizens, we would coerce that person. We would literally lock them into an involuntary, um, you know, state of of uh, captivity. Um, we wouldn't necessarily, which wouldn't necessarily result in changing their beliefs or their ideas about how they treat yeah, other people. It would just get them out of the mix. So, um, if you can't stop killing yeah, people, we'll put yeah. you in a position where you can. Oh, uh, now I will say that you know, repeatedly in this dialogue, um, the person kept telling me, you know, that there's other there, indoctrination can happen outside of religion, and I never ever denied that. Like yeah. I, I never once said that that's not true. And in fact, I said I agreed that there are examples, you know, within probably most cultures that you can find something that is amenable to or that is uh, lends itself to propaganda, which would be like dishonest distortion of information in order to try to sway people to think a different way. Um, you can find situations where, you know, people might grow up, uh, like, for example, we have people that are in our society that would be racist, that would probably raise their children and trying to indoctrinate them into racism that would, you know, teach them sort of hateful things and teach them um, to not think about it, to just accept that we're better than this group over here um, and they are not as good and there would be lots of, you know, uh, authoritarianism with that. There's not a lot of ra reasoning with the person to get them to believe this. I think, I think there's a, an example. Well, first of all, you know, you've got socialization, you have indoctrination, and doc indoctrination can, of course, occur outside of religion, but I'm not even sure that we can even say that all indoctrination is necessarily bad. Now, if we we're going to define it that way, that this is, I would say that uh, certain aspects of the time I spent in boot camp were indoctrination more than just socialization and instruction. There is, there is a, a, a process of mental breakdown that does, I mean, and I was wondering earlier how much of this goes to like the religion cult line, where, where you mm -hmm. draw that line. Um, and and there's, there's parts of that that, that work that way. Yeah, but I, I would say that when, you're, when you can identify threads of authoritarianism that are basically like, you know, when you ask a question, you're just told that's how it is and that's the answer, um, you may be looking at indoctrination. And if people are being coerced, when you hear things like, if you don't believe this, all these horrible things will happen. Mm. This is so much better than this other thing. And, and there's no real reasons being given. It's not really explained in a way that is amenable to questioning. And if you question it, that's, I think, what I'm talking about. The coercion is, comes along when people start to question. So when, when coercion is used to keep you from thinking and questioning, when authoritarianism is used as the answer and the explanation for why you have to accept these things, 
um, you're looking at something that goes beyond just the requirements of socializing a person. That's more than teaching you to use a knife and fork. That's more than teaching you the language. That's more than teaching you to shake hands and uh, hold a door for someone. You know? and, and these things may be different at different ages as well. Sure. So if you're talking about young children who aren't necessarily acting of their own volition and aren't uh, of, an, of an age where they can um, consent and understand and all the other, these other things, you may be engaged in indoctrinating. Right. A, a, a little, yeah, a little, people, people communicate, their communication psychology changes throughout their lives. And when you're little, you have what's called um, black and white thinking. Um, what I find is that people that are into environments that are heavily indoctrinal, they tend to carry this black and white thinking into adulthood. They don't ever outgrow this. It's, it, we're supposed to grow it out at a very young age. You're supposed to outgrow this, but some people keep going with this into adulthood. Um, black and white thinking is that you know it's good or bad. Um, and yes, you use that with like a very tiny child who has not developed like the cognitive uh, psychology that's required to assess a situation. So for example, the hot stove um, to a very small child you're going to present that stove or an iron um, as simply hot and dangerous and bad. And you, you don't really, it, the child doesn't need to really understand how or why or when it's bad because later on when he gets old enough to grasp that it can be hot sometimes, it's not hot all the time. Um, then he can kind of begin to police himself about when he touches the stove, doesn't touch the stove. But when he's really tiny, you just don't want him to ever touch it, right? Because he can't assess it and you don't want him, you want him to kind of fear the stove, fear the iron. Um, don't go near it because it could really hurt you if you go over there at the wrong time and touch that thing. Stove bad. Yeah, it's bad, it's hot. Usually that's what we teach him. Hot, hot, burn you, you know, and the kid is like, ooh, you know, you'll hear the little children repeat that, like, ooh, hot, you know. So they understand that hot is not good. Um, as soon as a child burns himself and understands hot. And later then... on they learn that hot is good. <laughs> 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 But anyway, that was kind of what I wanted to get at was the idea that, um, yeah, you could, I, if you want to call it socialization, that's fine, but please differentiate be between the idea of merely socializing and socializing in a way that is um, actually harmful, that impedes critical thinking, that discourages questioning, discourages uh, expression of doubt, that even threatens and coerces, you know, to avoid, uh, and, and also it's about thought control too, that's important, because like I said, locking someone in a cage is not indoctrination. indoctrination Indoctrination is when you get them to lock themselves in a cage mentally. That's what your goal is when you indoctrinate a person, is getting them to stop asking by them on their own. Um, and so anyway, there, it's, it's not that difficult. I, I agree there's probably gray areas of things that you could come up yeah. with, like a lot of gray areas, and I understand that. But basically, you know, there's gray areas too when it gets into is something okay or not okay to do <clears throat> to a child if you're a parent. You know, you can have gray areas where people will argue back and forth. Is this abuse? Is this okay? Is this wrong? Is this harmful? How harmful is it? Is it okay to do something if it's beneficial but it might be a little harmful? I mean, you get these gray areas, but in the end, if somebody's child ends up dead in the hospital because they beat it to death, that's abuse. And it's not healthy parenting. Um, and so to say that because you can sometimes find these um, gray areas in between that we don't have any metric for abuse is uh, yeah. completely wrong. That's, that's, and we hear that type of thing. The thing All is, the we're, time. we're bad. We are bad at distinguishing um, things on a spectrum. Yeah, black and from, white thinking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. it's easy to go for the extremes and it's much more difficult to sort out the things in the middle. Where, where is that exact line? Well, there is no exact line. There is, there's right. not necessarily an exact line um, between uh, socialization and indoctrination, between uh, gay and straight, which is already a mess by putting those labels on it anyway, but you know, between religions and cults. Well, religions are all cults. Yes, under one understanding of cult, they're all cults, but under the normative, you know, the, the the, the psychological definition of cult, there's, there's a slight difference there. And so, you know, Joe Bob down the street yeah. who uh, is, just loves Jesus and, and doesn't really, you know, get bothered by a lot of things probably isn't yeah. part of a cult. Especially the people, uh, anybody who's praying for their football team today, probably not in a cult. <laughs> Because you, you probably aren't taking your religion. Well, the other thing seriously. too, though, is there are some religious, um, do, like religious uh, groups that don't really threaten. Yeah. That don't threaten you. You just you can uh, adopt them or not adopt them. I mean, 
<laughs> Whatever. Yeah. yeah. You believe what you believe. I so believe not I believe. all religions are indoctrinating people, and not all um, not all groups that indoctrinate people are religions. But that doesn't mean that uh, socialization yeah. and indoctrination are the equivalent of one another. So let's go ahead and uh, get started taking some calls. As a reminder, after the show's over, we get together and go to dinner at Threadgill's 301 West Riverside Drive, which they'll put right about there. And um, we'll start with George in Dunmore. How are you? I'm good. Hello, Matt and Tracy. Um, I want to start off by saying I think it is um, horrendously absurd to compare religion to child abuse. Um, Um, I do not abuse the children who I am teaching religion to. I am enlightening them, broadening their mind. George? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, I don't necessarily equate religious teaching to child abuse. Well, I sat here and listened to rambling on for about 20 minutes about indoctrination. Okay, George, um, let's be clear. I have on occasion said that some religious teaching, some religious instruction should be viewed as a form of child abuse. I do not equate religious teaching with child abuse. And Tracy wasn't necessarily talking about religious teaching at all. She was talking about an actual distinction between indoctrination and socialization that applies beyond religion. And if all you're going to do is come in butthurt and saying that that you listen to her ramble for 20 minutes, we're probably not going to have a very productive call. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, sir, but that's the way I interpreted that. Well. That's not what I said, though. is Is it still the way you interpret it? Well, as long as you make yourself clear now, then it's fine. Well, People hear what they want to yeah. hear, I think, sometimes. So anyway, what else? Well, the reason I called in was because on this show I've noticed the hosts never stop talking about how there is no evidence of God in this world. Well, no, I, no good I evidence. I have a list here of evidence that I can give you other than the Bible. Yeah, it, what my, I, I would clarify to say that there's no good evidence or there is not sufficient evidence it is false it is false to say that there's no evidence because under you know when people are talking about anecdotal evidence and things like that of course there are testimonies and no, there's I've all sorts of times the whole of this show would say that there I, is no evidence I, I, I understand that George I am trying to clarify this for you so that so that you understand that yes in the in the past there have been mistakes made by me and by others where in the context of the discussion, we say, oh, there's no evidence for the existence of God. And what, we're, what we mean and what we should be saying is that there is not sufficient evidence for the existence of God or that there is no good evidence for the existence of God well, from our, pro- from, 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 from our point of view. Well, I hardly, dis- I have to disagree with you, sir. Here's best evidence. I-, I have a list here of evidence I could give you that I'm one. sure you, sure. you cannot deny. It's can you give us the, the best one? That the best there one. There is a God. Can you, give us, can you give us the best one? Yes, sir. The miracle of the sun. The miracle of the sun? <laughs> the There's miracle of the sun, sir. Fatima. When the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared in Fatima in 1917 to the three children, one of them being Lucia dos Santos, who lived her outer days until 2005. So this is not a witness from thousands and thousands of years ago. This is a woman who, up until a few years ago, was still alive. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. George, is, is this the same one where they, they said the sun was moving all over the place? There were um, at least 30,000 people that went, witnessed it, Adam. Yeah, that was, that's not it, really substantiated. I've, I've looked this up before. Yeah, it, the it, newspaper article. It, yeah, right I know. It was some reporting that was done, and reporting is never wrong. Before but, the expanded <laughs> size of the crowd. Yeah, I, I know. I, I'm just saying that you can look up. You can, George, are you going to listen or talk? You can look up assessments of it's this. Incredible movement, South. George, okay. listen to Tracy for a second. You, you can actually look up rebuttals. Let's just put it on hold for a second. You can look up rebuttals to this for the viewers. He just keeps talking, so yeah, he doesn't know you're talking. For the viewers that are watching, you can go and look this up. There are rebuttals to it. The information is not as solid as uh, you might think by the people that claim it. Now, that being said, I was trying to confirm with George, because I don't have the information right in front of me, whether or not this was the miracle where they claimed that the sun was moving all over the sky. 
Um, and if that is in fact the case, I would like to know how uh, the Earth didn't go flying out of its orbit. Oh, is he? Uh, I, you there, George? Yeah. It, the, the Earth did not go flying out of its orbit because it was, was a miracle which was being controlled by God. Okay. And God prevented that from happening. So the sun, this is the one where they said the sun was just going all over the place, but nobody else saw it, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't reported anywhere else in the world where the sun was showing at that time. Is that correct? Yes, well, that's, okay. it's a miracle. Yeah, is, it could also be an incorrect report. By 30,000 plus people? It wasn't sure. that many people. Um, you need to go and look and see how valid these sources are. So here's the thing. First of all, um, we have no way of actually investigating this. And... The, we don't know how, can I finish, George? Can I finish for real? For, for realsies, can I talk? There are, there are witnesses George. 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 There, there is, wait, there's no verification to these claims. No, there, there is no, there was, we've done this before. There is no, um, there were no, uh, what do you call it, like um, observatories that reported that the sun moved from its, place in the sky. There was no other reports from any other place where it was daytime at the time saying that the sun had moved. There was, I mean, there is nothing to substantiate that what these people claimed they saw really occurred. Nothing to verify it. It's just their claim. And, and moreover, the point that I was trying to get to is that we have a report of something happening. Even if those people are honest and this is what they apparently saw, we have no demonstration that A, it actually happened, or B, that it was supernatural in origin. Maybe there was some right. sort of atmospheric well, phenomenon that caused an illusion. No, but but would you, sh you better let me show. finish. I swear to your God, George, I'll hang up on you if you let me finish. The other thing is, you have no justification for claiming that the cause of this event, even if it occur occurred, is a God. You cannot claim that without yes, evidence yes. by... Yeah, and I, would, I just want to correct one thing. Um, I do think that we can verify that it did not happen. Now, what you were saying... Well, we, can't, we can't verify right. that people didn't experience right. it. Right, and, and that was something I wanted to make sure, because there was something you said that kind of crossed that line, and I just want to make sure that it was clear to the viewers, because there is absolutely... I mean, there are people that would have... Everybody in the daytime part of the globe at that point would have reported this. It would have been reports from everywhere if the sun had actually moved. So we know that, objectively speaking, the externally from the, from the perspective of what did the sun do that day, it did not move. Now, if these people said they saw it, you, you know, I don't know how valid the reports are because when you try to look it up and you try to really substantiate this, you really can't get any valid reporting out of it. It's, it's like this little tiny area in Mexico where somebody went and spoke to some people and you get, and all it is, it's like claims from the Bible. It's just going and talking to people and they're making, saying, oh yeah, and my cousin George was there. And, you know, it's so you end up with these like, relayed secondhand accounts that end up getting reported and then you, you get these conflicting reports and it's just, it's a mess. But the fact is, if the sun was moving around, it would have wreaked havoc on the planet. Observatories would have reported it and every, there would have been more than just one little town in some city in Mexico that would have seen the sun flying all over the sky. I, I mean, it, we can absolutely, you know, say that this, whatever they think they saw or didn't see, if they're telling any kind of truth out of there, that we know that in fact what they think they saw did not occur. And as Matt was saying, even if something did occur, there's no substantiation there that it was produced by a, by a deity. Yeah, and so if we already know that the sun wasn't actually moving around all over the place, then what we're in a position of somebody is telling us that a bunch of people reported that this thing happened, which we know didn't happen. Right. Now, that doesn't mean they're all lying. Um, which is the point I was getting at, they could all have thought they saw something. And there could be any number of potential natural explanations, and there could also be supernatural causes. I have no idea. Yeah. And so I'm in a position where I need to investigate and say, okay, can we demonstrate that some phenomena occurred? Well, actually, no, not really. We have a report, and yes, it's a lot of people, but that's an appeal to popularity. And, you know, I can't point to any others with 30,000, but you can go find groups of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens together. That doesn't mean they actually were. 
Um, by the way, these people are still alive and they'll tell you their story. You can talk to them right now. So we can't demonstrate that a phenomenon actually occurred, which means we can't even begin to investigate to find out what the potential cause is. What we can do is speculate about what sort of natural causes are more likely. This is something I'm going to talk about next week um, at the North Texas Secular Student Conference when I talk about um, uh, skepticism, the nature of evidence, critical thinking, and, and doing some yeah. magic and mentalism as well, is in order to determine whether or not what explanations are most probable, you have to have some way of determining the probability of a particular explanation. And so if you roll a die, um, there's six faces. It's a one in six probability that any particular side is going to come up. If you have a hundred claims of um, answered prayer, we know we have evidence that some of those claims of answered prayer are answered by natural explanations or natural explanations are such that they're perceived to be answered prayer. And then there's a bunch of them that we don't know. We have zero confirmed accounts of a supernatural being actually answering prayer. So when you're calculating the probability, it is always more probable that there's a naturalist ex explanation that you don't know than that a god did it. And when you're talking about reports like this, where yeah. we are far removed from the events and the people, we cannot go, we don't have a time machine, we can't go back. And we know, as Tracy pointed out, that the actual claim, oh, the sun moved around, that part is false. Actually, what they should have said is, from our point of view, it appeared that the sun moved around all over. Well, I can't do anything to prove that they didn't experience that, but I also can't explain it. And that's the point. Neither can you. Neither can the people who are claiming that this was a miracle from God. They have no justification for that. And I do want to say, please, please be wary when somebody hands you reports of supernatural phenomenon that come out of like third world areas, small villages. There's no way to confirm this stuff. I mean, people end up going there. They'll report something. I think I gave a, a last time I was on, I talked about um, anthropologists reporting um, about um, exorcism and how when you read the report, it's almost astounding what you read. But then when you see the video, you're just like, there's nothing, I don't see this. I don't see what they're reporting that they saw. So you, people get taken up with you know, a, a situation and think they see things sometimes they don't actually see. And the more people you have sort of enforcing that around you, um, and the more attention that you give to people who claim they saw it, you know, the, the more yeah. positive attention you get for telling a fib. I mean, that's just like the boy who cried wolf. If you keep giving somebody positive attention for, for lying or for saying, yeah, I, I saw it too. Come talk to me, you know, come, come interview me. Uh, there, there's it couple, happens. Yeah, there's a couple of emails that have come in recently where people have relayed things to me. And one of them is they'd send me to a video of some supposed God healer guy who's doing miraculous healings and causing the blind to see or doing the uh, limb lengthening, which if you go to the, camera, the, oh, the one shot real quick, um, it's roughly the equivalent of this. Can you see that? How now that arm's a lot longer. I can fix it by pulling this one out. I mean, that's really the type of thing that people are talking about as miraculous healings. And we already know that a lot of these people are faking. But somebody else yeah. wrote in the other day to, to I, I find it interesting that George's best evidence is this sketchy report. And, and the reason I think that he's convinced of it is because there's a number attached to it. Because right. 30 to 100,000 people reported this. But the rebuttals are all over the internet for this. I yeah. mean, just go and look it up if you have any doubt about the questions that surround this But that's what, that's what he cited as his best evidence. Another individual sent me an email in, the, in this past week talking about the miracles that he's witnessed, including people rising from the dead. Now, that was his first claim. He had witnessed the dead returning to life. And I was tempted to go on and explain that, okay, I, I want specifics. And, for example, we don't know that much about defining death. It's not a, necessarily a point right. or a process. And, but he comes back and he tells me the story. Uh, I would say stop me if you've heard this, but everybody would stop me right off the bat. Um, about a young kid who's out on a boat on a lake who falls overboard and is underwater for about 17 minutes or so, and the doctors say that he's not going to revive, and if he does, he's going to have brain damage, and lo and behold, somebody prays, and the kid recovers. And he sends me this, and I replied and said, okay, these reports, um, while not everyday occurrences, 
happen a lot, and we've actually done some investigation, or happened enough that we've investigated this, and we've understand about the mammalian diving reflex, and uh, the reaction to, in particular, cold water amplifies this, such that your body will shut down. And kids, the, the suspicion is that this is because of uh, features that are built into us in utero, because you're basically in a sack of fluid, and that kids are more likely to survive in this circumstance than adult. And I'm pointing to all this stuff in order to say that maybe this was a miracle, maybe it wasn't, but we have this naturalistic explanation for it, which we see over and over and seems reasonable. And I send that off, and he comes back with, well, no, 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 the water wasn't cold. Uh, I didn't say it had to be. Right. That's not a requirement. I'm just saying it works better in that situation. And, by the way, two weeks later, this little boy comes up to his mommy and tells him that Jesus and some angels took him to heaven. How could he know that? How could he? Four-year-olds can't understand life and death that way. Let me tell you something. If you're a four-year-old in a household of people who think that you've just been saved by a miracle, I'd be dumbfounded if within two weeks you weren't claiming that Jesus and the angels took you up there. Kids are little sponges, and they're after their, their, their parents and uh, family members' attention and approval. And if the people in the family, and don't tell me that they weren't, are running around talking about how Jesus saved their son from a drowning death, <laughs> yes. and you think it's a miracle that two weeks later he finally catches on. I'm surprised he wasn't doing it in two days and talks about how Jesus took None of this is miraculous. All of this is mundane. Now, the, the being underwater for 17 minutes and recovering is not uh, normal, everyday happenstance, right. but it's not in the realm of the miraculous. But it's way more miraculous than second and third hand reports of 30,000 people who supposedly saw something that looked like the sun moving around. I mean, come on now. What, what, what about that? I, I'm convinced, I'm, right now, I'm convinced that the thing that was convincing about that was the number. All these people couldn't be wrong. Yes, they could. Yeah, it's always that. And the thing is, there is no way to verify that the number of people that reported it or the number of people who were being accurate. Again, it was like this, it's a tiny piece mm -hmm. of dirt in Mexico somewhere. It was like a little tiny town. It wasn't, it, we're not talking about a metropolis. This isn't like it happened in New York and was captured on ABC, you know, from their cameras. Uh, it wasn't like that. That's not the kind of verification that you're going to find when you start trying to figure out what was actually reported. And, by and when that happens, by the way, when it does happen in New York and yeah. it's captured, we'll have a lot better information to actually investigate, figure out what happened, yeah. if, if anything, and whether or not we can. Yeah, you won't just have hearsay of someone saying, yeah, it's about 30,000 people claiming this, and, you know, I'm telling you this, and how did you, how did you count that number? How yeah. did you... Yeah. Anyway, since we're on for an hour, we're going to go and get some more calls real quick. Robert and Bowling Green, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm um, glad I could get a hold of you guys. I sure. kind of didn't think I was going to make it, but uh, hey, how are you doing? Uh, Hello. Not too bad. <sighs> well, I've just got kind of a personal question. It isn't anything philosophical or anything. It's just um, there, there are a lot of atheist personalities popping up on the Internet and YouTube. Um, that's where I met you guys and, you know, got to watch your show and got to, you know, know your positions a little better. And, uh, ooh, sorry, I'm kind of tired. Um, and a little we'll spice nervous, it up so for I kind of stutter. <laughs> but, um, basically I'm just wondering what you guys think of some of the more prominent personalities like, say, uh, The Amazing Atheist, for example, or Cult of Dusty, because some of them come off as kind of combatant and that might be off-putting to other people. Mm -hmm. I just want to know you know, what do you guys think of that? I don't really follow the atheists on YouTube, so I can't really respond. Yeah, uh, the, okay. I only, the only one that you mentioned that I hadn't even heard of is the Amazing Atheist, and um, I don't find him that amazing. But um, <laughs> I'd, yeah. um, but he has said some things um, that I've seen that I thought were awesome. I mean, and I'm pretty sure I could yeah. say that for almost anybody. I mean, I, I've seen videos from Pat Condell where I was I like, seen him. awesome. Yeah. And I've seen other ones from him that I was like, wow, that's, you know, and, and that's the case. You know, there's nobody that I'm probably going to agree with on everything. Um, there's a number of YouTube atheists that are among my friends, like Aaron Ra, who's been on the show a couple times, um, and some that are among ex-friends and uh, stuff like that. But, yeah, I don't. The thing is, um, I tell you who, who, I, who I do, uh, everything I've seen from him I, I definitely like, and that's uh, theoretical bullshit. Um, there's, there's a few others um, who everything I've seen I like, which doesn't mean I like necessarily everything, but you know, you, that's the beauty of it is you, you, know, you get to make up your own mind who's, who's to your taste and who's not, because there's, there's no question at all that I'm not to some people's taste. Yeah. Um, yeah. And young woman, and, Chris, and, she does some good ones, too. The, oh, yeah, and she's actually going to be here for yeah. uh, the American Atheist Convention in March 31st-ish here in Austin. 
Hmm. That sounds like fun. But anyway. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to give a rundown uh, on on my ratings for everybody on YouTube. Uh, okay, I, I wasn't even saying necessarily that. I was just saying, like the general, the way people are perceived in terms ah, of you know, and, like and whether or not there's too much negativity and anger and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah, um, I'm pretty much of the opinion that almost all uh, approaches are. That there's, that there's a place for any of them. There's a time and a place for ridicule. There's a time and a place for um, education. There's a time and a place for kind of uh, not being confrontational with somebody in order to help kind of guide them along. Um, I've used any or all approaches over the last seven or eight years, however long it's been now. Um, and I think there's room for almost all of it. There, there are, though, a handful of people who seem to be like, for example, Greta Christina's uh, Why Are You Atheist So Angry? Brilliant. Love it. It's, it's one of the best blog posts. It's one of the best talks I've ever seen. I love it. I love Greta. I love that talk. Um, there's, there's a difference, and she points out to some extent the difference between being righteously, justifiably angry. I mean, if you're, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. And, of course, you should be speaking out. And... Um, uh, the kind of over-the-top, non-productive, I'm just angry, um, which I think is, is something we should generally avoid. Yeah, I mean, that's the way the amazing atheist seems to portray himself. I mean, I like a lot of things he says, but I don't necessarily like the way that he portrays it because he does a lot of, I guess, um, I don't know if it's uh, sensationalism. Like, if you, if you watch his show and then you watch some of the other things that he's been on, he's way dumped down outside of his channel. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I, I don't know him well enough to say that, other than, other than to say there's things he said that I, that I liked and some things that he said that I definitely haven't. Um, but I, this is not the time and the place to go through a whole list like that. But thanks. Okay, that's fine. Thanks for the call, Robert. Absolutely. Thanks. Or were you just calling to see if you could start another fight on YouTube? <laughs> ah, well, doesn't make much difference. Uh, is it Naeem and Zurich? Um, yes, hi. Hi, uh, thanks for calling. Hi, Tracy. Hello. Yes. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, Islam and have uh, some question to you. Well, um, my first question is, um, do you both consider Islam as a threat to the U.S. Constitution or the Bill of Rights or both of them? No. I don't know about you. Do you think Islam is a threat to the Constitution or the Bill of Rights? I, don't, I wouldn't say Islam so much as I would say like over zealous theocratic religionists um, but that would be in any religion it, my, my, my answer with regard to Islam mm. is just that it's such a small portion of the population here they have no power base uh, with which to affect any sort of change well maybe not in the US but in, uh, right yes. now in Europe is a, I think it could be a, th a threat because yeah, I, in, I think the UK, in the UK the UK is a, always a a discussion about uh, how to in, to make the Sharia law a part of the UK law, and also in Germany they talk about the Sharia law, yep. especially about the family law. Yeah, I, I agree that it's potentially a threat to uh, uh, rights and freedoms in other places outside the United States. Um, I, I think there's a number of countries that have made far too many concessions. Uh, on behalf of a religion, um, although I think I think if you jump into the Middle East, uh, you can see the the end product of what what those types of laws actually do to people, um, which is of course my primary concern. Yeah, I ask uh, because um, I have seen uh, some uh, YouTube videos and about Dearborn in Michigan, mm -hmm. and. I don't like the Christian at all. I am an atheist. Uh, I don't consider them to be a little bit bullied, but but they practice just uh, freedom of speech, and they got uh, threatened and hit and, and escorted outside the uh, the town or outside the, the festival by police force and the ma uh, mayor. Uh, don't you think that it could be in some parts uh, uh, a threat to the Constitution. Well, are there places in the United States, little pockets of 
of, I was going to say humanity, but I guess quasi-humanity, where religious zealots of some stripe or another are violating uh, the rights of individuals, you betcha. We've seen um, atheist families run out of town on a rail almost uh, in a couple of areas. And it wouldn't surprise me to hear that, that where, where perhaps a bunch of Muslims have gotten together, that they might have more power over what is allowed and what isn't allowed within their, uh, within their, their city or town or whatever. Um, but I don't see that as a, as a broader th threat to the United States. It's just something that we need to keep addressing and saying, no, you don't get to do this. Okay. Yes, and uh, my last uh, little question would be, um, which religion do you both think is the most uh, stupidest? Most of uh, the stupidest? Yeah. Okay. I don't think I have a, like, a top. I mean, there, there's... There, I could probably come up with some that are like least objection or less objectionable, um, a few, but I mean, in the end, they all have these wild tales that are, you know, I mean, there, there's always something a little wild going on. Um, and usually it's like an entire construct of wild that, uh, that applies. I think for me, it's a tie between Mormonism and Scientology. And um, why Mormons or... Scientology, what's special about them? Um, first of all, they're both pretty new, so we can kind of track their origins. In the case of Mormonism, we can track their origins to a con man. And in the case of Scientology, we can track its origins to a science fiction author who talked about forming a religion to get rich. Um, and then there are the, the uh, obviously false things that uh, are within both of them uh, that tend to get covered up, you know, within Mormonism, the idea that... Uh, the Native Americans were the lost tribe of the Israelites, um, and that you know, this whole kind of racist thing about uh, blacks, which they're trying to shovel under the carpet, but making up um, a language, uh, or it's, I forget what it is, something Egyptian. Anybody remember? It's modern Egyptian. I don't know. He made up a language, uh, claimed and, and, and mistranslated um, Egyptian hieroglyphics uh, in order to support his stuff. And then in Scientology, it's one of those, um, it's pseudoscience taken like to the extremes. It's things that if you knew the stuff that you find out later at the beginning, you'd never fall for this in a million years. But it's this insidious little kind of suck you in um, oh, would you like to take a personality test? Hey, we think we can help you. And by the way, uh, the intergalactic overlord Xenu uh, threw everybody in volcanoes and destroyed them with atomic bombs, and all those bodies are now uh, thetans that are uh, hanging on to you, and we need to get rid of all those for you. Uh, that's just crazy. I mean, that's, that's a whole new well, level of... What's funny to me, though, is like I know, I personally know people, like for example, I know some Jehovah's Witnesses who fully reject the idea of ghosts, so they don't believe in, like, like I guess, I don't, I don't really get it all. It's like at some point, I suppose, someone's going to come back from the dead and live forever. I don't know. But when you die, like, they think you just die. And I'm not sure how the, the end times fits into that. Don't even, you know, I have no clue. But they mock the idea of, like, a ghost. But they are totally into demons, right? So it's like, you know, ghosts are silly stuff. But, you know, demons are real. So I, I don't know sometimes how, like, I, I don't really understand, like, where those lines are in the sand where they, something becomes too silly and something else is believable to them. And it's not just JWs. I just use that as the example. But it seems like it's, the, it's that way with almost any religion. You can talk to people and they'll be making sense and then suddenly they're just over the rainbow and you're like, how did that even happen? Okay. <laughs> well, same sort of a little talk. Um, sure. Bye. Thanks for calling. Bye bye. All right. Uh, and no. Uh, hey, David. This is Matt. Oh, hey, man. How's it going? Not taking this question on the on the show. Uh. Okay. You can email me. Uh, I'm not dredging up Elevator Gate and Dawkins and apologists for sexism on the show. It's just too much to get into in the last 15 minutes. Okay, And it's been hashed and rehashed. I'd be happy to talk about it outside. And as a matter of fact, I have. Um, I got a video up on YouTube about it. Yeah, uh, 
can you give me? Uh, I'd love to email about it, uh, you about it. I actually just heard about it, and I just wanted to weigh in. Yeah, uh, uh, just hearing about it. Wow, <laughs> cool. TV at atheist-community.org. That gets to all of us. Okay. So Thanks, Dave. If you keep an eye out, I think I got something uh, constructive to say about it. I doubt that, but I'm looking forward to hearing it just in case I'm wrong. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right. Kenny in Elk Grove, how are you? Hey, how are you, Matt? Nice to talk to you again. Pretty good. Uh, we had a nice little discussion last time about uh, uh, radioactive fracturing and minerals being indicative of uh, accelerated radioactive decay, and after listening to you and Martin, I decided to go a different research avenue and looked into nuclear waste management and found a bunch of articles on radiation damage to minerals by uh, scientists that are publishing uh, more in this century. Uh, and so basically, uh, I'm finding a lot of the same thing. Uh, they're observing the same phenomenon of the fractures occurring in the strongest part of the mineral instead of the weakest part where it would be predicted if it was slowly expanding. Have an 87 article and then some other articles. The 87 article uh, is about a zircon. There's four or five scientists that contributed that paper. And so what I'm in the process of doing is uh, following up on a, find a close agreement by a group of competent scientists that specialize in this area. Which have have you done that do. yet? Well, I'm doing that okay, now. Okay, then I, I don't need to rehash the whole conversation here. When you actually get to that point, um, then maybe we can talk about it, except that I'm not a geologist, so maybe it would be better to not call into an atheist TV show, but instead actually go sure, talk to scientists. Sure, sure I agree with, with you on that. Okay. Um, it might be actually helpful to your show, too, if your call screeners discourage scientific discussion. Well, it, that would help, uh, too. Yeah, um, except that we're not here to discourage uh, scientific discussion. There are certain th elements of scientific discussion that we're okay with. Um, but if you, f in the cases where it were calls like the one that we previously had, where you're going to call and offer, well, you know, I, I don't have um, resources here to have that sort of debate. Um, but at the end of the day, even if you, your position was right, it doesn't do anything to tell us about or, or to, to disprove... Exists. Uh, the bulk of of science and demonstrate that a God exists. But what what did you have for us today? Well, I wanted to ask you some questions. I figured uh, you haven't had a discussion in detail about the uh, uh, the what happened to the Canaanites and uh, foreign national slavery in uh, Leviticus. And uh, I was wondering, have you by any chance uh, read the twelfth chapter of the Wisdom of Solomon? Book um, in the Septuagint. Uh, I don't recall. Well, what it basically? Oh, are you still talking? Nope. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm watching your mouth, and I'm, the words are coming over later. Yeah, there, there's a delay. I'll try not to watch it. That's a good um, idea. Yeah. I recommend that for everybody. Stop watching. Oh no, 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 wait. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. we got like well, 12 minutes anyway. left in the show, and you want to talk about the Canaanites and slavery? So let's get to it. Well, we'll get to the Canaanites. We probably don't have time for the slavery, but the Canaanites are addressed in uh, Wisdom of Solomon as being basically individuals that sacrificed you're, children, grilled them, and ate them. You're talking about a non-canonical book. Well, sure, but it's, it's not canonical to the Protestants. I'm not a Protestant. I'm Eastern Orthodox. Okay, but, uh, okay, sure. So, and, and, I, and I don't really care. I mean, you can pull from canonical box, the, the text in Deuteronomy, or you can pull from external. What, what difference does it make? What, what is the case that you're making? Well, the case I'm making is, is that uh, what is going on in the book itself, it, it's discussing how God was patient for years and years with the Canaanite, that he showed them the example of what happened to Egypt, which you probably don't believe happened, but uh, anyway, it's still in there. And uh, all this went on, and then he stated uh, that because of what you're doing to children, and these were not their own children, they were kidnapping Israeli children, they were kidnapping of other tribes and killing their children. And okay. since they weren't changing their ways, God decided to wipe them out. Yeah, and, and uh, what's your point? Because My point we, is we, he was justified in doing it. So, including killing their kids? 
Yes, her kids were killed. Yeah, you're a moral thug. In the city and, <laughs> and crushing their skulls. Okay, open. wait, Kenny, wait, wait, wait. I, Kenny, Kenny, Kenny. And do the same thing. I have a question. Oh no! So your 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 reasoning is that it's okay to kill the Canaanites' kids because they're going to grow up to do the same thing. Well, they would have. You're a moral thug. You are, you have lost do your you moral well, compass wait, entirely. I, I actually Canada, have like a different children question. Children were doing this when the Israelites were coming to the city. They were. Kenny, you're an idiot. A two-year-old is not doing anything. Are you saying two-year-olds were, were killing two-year-olds? No, no, I'm not saying that. So I'm when they came that. in and wiped out their two-year-olds, the innocent kids, your claim is that that was justified? Two-year-olds can't throw rocks. Yes, so why would you kill them? About them? So why would you kill them? What? Why, why would God have them killed? Who says that God had all them killed? I just asked you if it was justified to wipe them all out, including their children, and you said yes. Yeah. I, you said children. I didn't interpret that as infants. Okay. Um, Just like, for example, what, what does wipe them out mean? What does wipe them out mean and not leave any of them alive? Well, actually, they didn't completely do a genocide. A lot of these people were incorporated into Israel itself. They were proselytized and, and changed. Some of the people repented. Well, they oh. did kill all the Amalekites, though. He had the children killed there. Was that justified? Well, let me ask you a question. If someone's in Vietnam and a young child walks up with a bomb in a box to hand it to him, is a soldier, another soldier justified in shooting that child to keep another soldier? So you're asserting that all the Amalekite children were carrying bombs that day? No, uh, of course not. Okay, I'm well not. then why so would it why be, would why would that even that? be relevant? Because you're, you're... What does that have to do with what I'm saying? Because yeah. the Amalekites were wiped out by the Hebrews under God's command who told them to wipe out the infants, the children and the infants. He even goes to a special little, little category there and tells them the children and the infants. So they went and they wiped out the Amalekites, including their children and their infants. And the question is... Was that the, uh, was that the one blessed is the man who bashes the little No, head no, again? that's no. a this is, this is, that's yet another place where the Bible really enjoys but this I guess slaughter of my children. Big question, well, my question, because you're talking about, okay. right, but I'm saying that it's, if he's going to command people to go, he's going to command the Hebrews to go and kill another group. And the Amalekites is an example I'm familiar with where he kills the children and the infants specifically. He even tells them to wipe out even the animals. So my question is, do you think that's justified? Do you know why um, societies back then destroyed everything, including the livestock? Why did Rome uh, sack Jerusalem the way that they did? We're talking about the why Hebrews here, because God told them. <laughs> we're, we're talking about whether God sanctioning something and whether or not it was moral yeah, to sanction Yeah, because you're it. saying that this is moral, no, right? The, the Romans, no, you wouldn't well, say okay, it was moral. First of all, by our standard of morality and the way we fight wars and do things, it's not moral. Well, then, uh, it, and it's the morality of an Islamic country, the way they might fight a war, it wait, might be... Wait, 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 wait. Kenny, are you saying that morality is entirely relative? That what you think is moral and what the Amalekites thought was moral? That there, we can't that you say... you cannot apply your standard of morality to a situation okay. of a people you don't understand. Oh, so yes, you, I absolutely can. You're asserting that Matt's standard of morality that so we shouldn't kill the children is bad? So you believe Israelite babies should be killed? And what did you just say? On the altar. You believe Israelite children should be slaughtered and sacrificed on an altar. That should have been permitted to continue. No. And when those children Kenny, up, Kenny, I swear to God, you better let me finish. Now, wait a minute. Wait, Kenny, let, me, let me just see. Kenny, no, hang on. Okay. No. I, Kenny, listen. No, I don't think that. Why on earth would you accuse me of thinking that? Kenny? Well, how can I? Am, am I still on? I thought I got shut off. No, you're on hold because you wouldn't let me finish. You basically said that I think, or do I think, that the Israelite children deserve to be killed and are asserting that that's my position, and I'm saying no. Why on earth would you claim that that was my position? You're the one that's... Can I answer it? Sure. Okay, here's my answer. When the children grew up, and raised by their surviving mothers, who wouldn't have been killed either if the women and the children were allowed to live. They would have raised that child Kenny, that had been what the, against Kenny, and turned right around and do the same Kenny, thing. Kenny, what they the hell does... They offered a way out, though. They, 
Kenny, what the hell does that have to do with my position? You made a claim about what I believe, and now you're going back to tell me about the ancient Israelites did this and that and this for this other. What the hell does that have to do with what I just asked you? Hello? Well, it has a lot to do because if you allow these people to live, they would kill Israelites. Kenny, you are entirely too stupid to talk to. I want to just make two points that I didn't get to make during the call. Number one is, I mean, just to clarify what you were describing as the misrepresentation of your position, right? Yeah. There are most people, I think, that would say that um, going to war with Germany during World War II was justified because of all the horrendous things that were happening there. They had to be stopped. And, and you know, you can argue all day about whether or not the, the tactics of particular parts of that war were, you know, humane, inhumane, whatever. But it was, I don't think there was any doubt that you weren't going to sort of reason with Hitler. And so you have sometimes something horrible going on, and you say, we're going to use force, we're going to go in there and stop this from happening. And that does not mean that you then go in and wipe out all the children, right? And just because someone asks and says, hey, I don't think you should go in there and kill all the Germans, all the, everybody, and including the infants and everything, and all the animals and everything, and then you say, oh, well, you just, you're okay yeah. then with Jews being killed in ovens? Yeah. I guess I that's mean, what that's that exactly means. that's exactly what it was. It's like, no, that, Why is, do you hate that the is, truth? is absolutely, it's almost offensively, obscenely stupid. Yeah. And then you, I had another question, which I wanted to ask was, wouldn't God have done better to protect his people's children? Like, instead of waiting patiently while the children are being sacrificed and, like, allowing children to be killed and sacrificed and brutalized by these people that are, like, you know, killing his people's children and he's not stopping it, and you're saying that his patience there is, is like, a good thing? His patience there is completely obscenely immoral. Nobody should be patient with people that are killing children. What the hell is that? I mean, how can you be... How can you even say, like, well, God was just trying to be patient with it. They're killing the children. You don't be patient. You protect those children. What the hell kind of God wouldn't protect children from somebody that's killing them on altars? I'll tell you, Wahoo. And, and then, the exact same kind of God that would say, screw it. I don't care who did it. Wipe them all out. Even their children. Yeah. What is this? So you let them kill What's a bunch of children, the and then you go and kill their children as a result. And it's just like, this is, it's just an obscenity. Yeah, you, your, your religion has completely poisoned your ability to think reasonably, especially on matters of morality. And it's because you are put in the position where you have to come up with some kind of defense for something that you, under any other circumstances, would look at as a moral atrocity. If the United States, when we went into Germany or any other place, if, if our mission statement was wipe them all out, we would be the same sort of a moral thug that your God supposedly is. That is not... It, it, this is not me. This is not me as a pacifist, or me saying that oh, the Canaanites should have been allowed to kill those children. That's that's but ridiculous. But here's the thing. I mean, you're talking about the same group of people and the same God in the same Bible, where He did all these things to protect them: big flaming fire and opening the Red Sea and swallowing up the Pharaoh's armies. And yet He just lets somebody come in over you know long periods of time and slaughter their children on altars, and He doesn't protect them. Plus, like, He's made our show end before I was ready for. For it to end, you jackass. Anyway, thanks a lot for calling. I'll be out next week. Russell will be here. I'll be up at the North Texas Secular Student Conference. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.